SCP-106, The Old Man. Horror is a lot of things to a lot of people. For some, it's a parking lot at night, or a dark forest, or walking into a spider web. For others, it's clowns, or heights, or public speaking. For many, though, horror is simply something utterly horrific, which brings us to SCP-106. 106 is another classic SCP whose continued popularity has put it at the forefront of the SCP universe. Much like SCP-096, SCP-173, SCP-076, and others, 106 is another inhuman monster with no regard for human life that can't seem to be killed. Unlike many of those dangerous SCPs, however, 106 seems to take a certain amount of pleasure in torturing humans. Let's look at exactly how 106 is considered horrific, and a couple tales that might explain where it came from. SCP-106 is a humanoid resembling an elderly male undergoing advanced decomposition. It can scale any vertical surface and hang there indefinitely while waiting for prey. It is not exceptionally agile, so it relies more on ambush tactics, capable of staying motionless for days if necessary. One of 106's main anomalous properties is its ability to corrode all solid matter it touches, from plant matter to metal, and especially to living tissue. This effect will continue for six hours after 106 removes its touch. This corrosion appears as rusting, rotting, and cracking, and also causes a black, mucus-like substance to coat the object similar to the substance covering 106 itself. 106's second main anomalous property is its ability to pass through solid matter, which leaves behind a patch of corrosive mucus. This ability seems to be connected to 106's capability of entering a pocket dimension, that is, a small alternative dimension created and controlled by 106. This pocket dimension seems to be comprised mostly of halls and rooms, and serves as a hunting ground for 106. 106 can enter this pocket dimension by traveling into any surface, and can return from the dimension from any surface connected to the entry point, such as entering a wall and coming out the ceiling, or entering an interior wall and coming out the exterior. 106 combines these abilities to hunt prey, generally humans from 10 to 25 years old, and incapacitates them with a touch. Usually, it will damage major organs, muscle groups, tendons, or bones, leaving the individual injured, but alive. It will then pull the person into the pocket dimension, where it will likely continue to toy with it. As you can imagine, containment of 106 is a little tricky as it can corrode anything it touches and walk through walls. It has been found that for some reason it has an aversion to lead, leading to the use of lead-lined steel in its containment unit. This containment unit is then surrounded by 40 layers of more lead-lined steel, each spaced apart from one another, and the entire thing is suspended off the ground. The secondary containment area consists of 16 spherical cells filled with different liquids, and a randomized assembly of surfaces and supports. It seems that 106 becomes confused when faced with complex and or random assemblies of structures. Additionally, the secondary containment area is fitted with light systems capable of automatically flooding the area in extremely bright light, which 106 also has an aversion to. Although these measures don't completely contain 106, they have worked to cut down on the overall number of containment breaches. The entire containment area is under constant 24-hour human surveillance, and any corrosion effect seen within 200 meters of 106's containment cell is cause for alarm. 106 does tend to break containment fairly often, however, occasionally lying in feigned dormancy for months at a time to lull staff into assumed security. After breaching containment, 106 will cause large amounts of corrosive damage to Foundation property and abduct as many people as possible back to its pocket dimension. 
Upon a breach, Foundation staff will repair the containment area as quickly as possible, and then bring in a human in the 10 to 25 age bracket, typically a D class. Once ready, staff will injure the subject, usually by cutting the Achilles tendon or breaking the thigh bone, causing them to become immobilized. They will be placed in the containment cell, and their wails and screams will soon bring 106 back. If this does not occur, more trauma might need to be inflicted on the subject, or multiple subjects might be brought in. Physical damage seems to have no effect on 106, of course so containment is so far the Foundation's only solution. That's SCP-106 as presented in the main document, but its popularity has caused a number of tales to pop up related to it. The most popular of these is titled The Young Man, and offers a potential origin to 106. The story takes place during World War I, centered around a corporal named Lawrence. Lawrence was a soldier that followed orders and fought as a soldier should, but had trouble fitting in. Nobody liked Lawrence, not due to lack of trying, but due to Lawrence being wired differently than others. He was quiet and still, kept to himself in the trenches, but everyone seemed to feel naturally uneasy around him. For the most part, Lawrence was utterly average, in height, weight, appearance, talent, and so on but he did possess some small notable quirks. He tended to stare at people slightly longer than was acceptable, and would often mumble in his sleep, rambling about odd, unsettling things. One soldier heard him mumble the name of his daughter, followed by a muffled giggle, causing the soldier to move to another barracks. Lawrence and 14 others were sent across no man's land to the enemy trench to secure it, after it had gone silent for several days. It was theorized by many that Lawrence was sent more to just get him away from most of the soldiers than due to his combat prowess. Many seemed to hope that Lawrence would be killed in the process. During the following three days, as Lawrence and the other 14 were away, the rest of the soldiers in the trench began to discuss the odd man. None of them ever remembered him discussing his home, and he never seemed to write any letters or receive any. He would often mention his dreams, but overall seemed to lack any passion. Questions about Lawrence floated up to the higher commands, as no one was able to actually find his station orders, or really any paperwork whatsoever about him. He'd come with a reinforcement squad from France, but none of the other reinforcements had seen him before, as they were a group of a number of different squads brought together. Nearly every man who shared a bunkhouse with him had gotten trench foot, and he seemed to leave behind a musty and sickly sweet smell. Whispers began to spread of Corporal Lawrence being a curse. Regardless, Lawrence and the other soldiers crossed no man's land and made it to the German trench, only to discover it empty and silent. The trench was completely devoid of life, even insects and rodents were absent. They did discover a sticky slime that seemed to have pooled into every divot and crack. Overall, the trench was in ruins, with nothing living or dead found, until one of the soldiers discovered the remnants of a human body. The flesh had somehow been smeared across the entire floor of a barracks, rotten bones sticking out at random angles, and the skull was resting on a bunk bed with ten fingertip bones crammed into the eye sockets. More remains were soon found, a ring of hands with the fingers interlaced, two men in a tunnel with leathery skin, thin as mummies, covered in an oily black scum. The latrines were overflowing with excrement and organs, the surface dotted with thousands of eyeballs. By this point, many of the men were loudly discussing retreating from this nightmare, but Corporal Lawrence was still rummaging around when he discovered a hole. It seemed to be the entrance to a natural cavern, and a private watched as Lawrence peered in before sliding in head first. The private rushed over to assist, but could see nothing in the inky blackness of the hole. He heard rustles of movement and the sound of liquid shifting, followed by a repulsive stench that sent the private retching. 
The rest of the soldiers came over, and soon Lawrence returned from the hole, pale and shivering, covered in a tarry black ooze. He began vomiting out more of the same black slime, shuddering and shaking constantly. Once he finally stopped, the soldiers grabbed him and quickly retreated from the trench, half dragging Lawrence with them. When they made it back to the other trench, they collapsed in a gasping, sobbing pile. The coherent ones were debriefed, and the strange sights were dismissed as battle fatigue and strange gas weapon tests. Lawrence said little of his time in the hole, saying that he fell into an underground pool, or buried latrine, struggled for a bit, and climbed out. He was told not to discuss the events, and oddly seemed in better spirits than he was before. Lawrence became more talkative, rambling about the joys of confined spaces, and of creation and destruction. A constant smile spread across his face, and the other soldiers wished for the old Corporal Lawrence to come back. One private told a friend that he had awoken one night to find Lawrence standing over him, his eyes gleaming. They found the private the next day caught in some barbed wire, his intestines spread around him in every direction. A few days later, a wasting sickness came upon the soldiers in the trench, eating their flesh like acid and causing it to become oozing and blackened. Many died from the sickness, and Lawrence was sent to a hospital, although he was later transferred to a mental ward after assaulting a nurse, resulting in her losing three fingers and the vision in her right eye. Lawrence would quietly rant to other patients about endless halls, pursuits in the dark, and flesh laid out like pages in a book. His behavior became increasingly unstable and unsettling, and would occasionally vanish entirely from the ward, only to return several hours later with no explanation. The strange wasting sickness that consumed his trench followed him wherever he went, and although numerous attempts were made to transfer Lawrence, no paperwork could ever be found about the man. One November night, however, Lawrence and 18 men disappeared between a five-minute nurse rotation. The room reeked of rust, oil, mold, and sweet rot, with thick swaths of black ooze covering the floor, beds, and walls. A spiral of human teeth was found under a bed, with the total number accounting for every missing person except one. The corporal was never seen again after that, nor were the other patients, and the incident was forgotten amidst the countless horrors of war. Stories emerged, however, of strange deaths, disappearing men later found broken and twisted, and of a strange dark figure stalking the towns of Europe. So, that's one possible explanation for where 106 came from. And even though part of the appeal of the SCP universe is the inherent mystery of the anomalies, some may appreciate a backstory. Even within this backstory, though, there are still some questions to be had, as it doesn't completely answer what happened to Corporal Lawrence. Was it some sort of singular alien entity that took over Lawrence and made him into 106? Or was it simply exposure to an unknown substance? and there could be potentially numerous 106s in existence. Like everything else, feel free to ignore this, or any other tale about 106, if it doesn't suit your fancy. Another potential explanation for 106 comes from the tale, Until Death. I won't go into as much detail about this one, and really this tale is only effective if you're already familiar with SCP-3001, Red Reality. The tale focuses on an older female researcher working late at night, alone in a Foundation facility. She hears a noise in the corner of the room and gets up to inspect it, when suddenly the lights go out, leaving her in darkness. She turns on her phone's flashlight and looks back at her desk to find a bloody human kidney resting on her papers. The noise she heard becomes thicker somehow, and she sees a black smear across a wall the paint and plaster corroding away. She walked towards the wall, and a hand shot out and grabbed her arm, 
the black slime melting through her lab coat. SCP-106 emerges from the wall, decrepit and rotten, and begins walking towards her, grinning. Black foulness dripped off of him, and the researcher ran out of the lab towards the night guard. As she met up with him, 106 came into sight, still following her. The guard fired three shots at 106, causing it to stop and fall to the ground, sinking through the floor. It's revealed that this is the first ever sighting of 106, and they have no idea what they've just witnessed. 106 appeared through the ceiling above the guard, dripping acid on his face, and proceeded to messily kill the man. The researcher had twisted her ankle and slowly limped away into the guard station. As she entered, however, she fell into the melting floor, her skin burning away due to the black ooze. She fully descended into the blackness, and she stopped feeling any pain. She was in a room she didn't recognize, and saw a dilapidated hallway in front of her, realizing that she was in some sort of alternate dimension. Optimistic that she could find a way out, she limped around, eventually opening a door and walking into her old apartment. Since this building had apparently been torn down 20 years ago, she was quite confused. Everything seemed to be in place as it was, but when she went to open a closet, a pile of dismembered corpses fell out on top of her. After flailing and gagging, she got out of the mess and recognized one of the faces as the night guards. 106 emerged from the back of the closet, and she began running again, now realizing that this was some sort of twisted version of the facility she worked in. She made her way back to the guard room where she had first entered this dimension, hoping that there was a similar way out, as 106 continued to chase her. Just barely, she makes it into the guard room and sinks through the same floor, re-emerging in the real facility. She hits the alarm button, but 106 is stopped right behind her. She realizes that this entity has taken the night guard's throat and put it into its own throat, causing a growling sound. The growling sound builds in intensity, becoming a word. Red. This is followed by two more words, which are both Anna. The realization slammed into her, and 106 took two steps towards her, holding up its hand where the ring had been. She was frozen, unable to move or think, and 106 finally reached out to touch her cheek. The flesh began dripping from her face, and 106 leaned in to kiss her, melting and fusing her face to his. She screamed, but it was useless as her tongue had also melted and her throat was filled with molten muscle. The two sunk through the floor together, locked in a final embrace. This tale is both a backstory to SCP-106, as well as an epilogue to SCP-3001, showing that Robert Scranton did manage to make it out of the Red Reality, but no longer as a human. If I can speak personally, Although I acknowledge the creativeness of the tale, I don't particularly care for it as an ending to Scranton's story. There are plenty that disagree with me, of course, and it's a popular alternative backstory for 106. Whatever you care to think of 106's origins, the old man is certainly one of the more horrific entities on the SCP wiki, at least as far as body horror is concerned. It's not everyone's favorite, and of course shows some of the signs of an early SCP, but we can all agree we'd rather not meet him in a dark alley. <laughs>